Coming up, we cook dinner. It's like boiling an egg, except you're boiling an air slide valve. E30 is fighting back. What is the matter with you? And let's spice it up a bit. Well, maybe we plop a V12 in it. Welcome back to the fourth installment of Project Marbay. In the previous episode, we started giving some much needed TLC to the E30, completed engine service, and ended up with a broken subframe bolt. So we're picking up the action right where we left off. The welding machine is here, so we're gonna do some welding. We need to extract this broken subframe bolt, and the way we're gonna go about it, I have a nut here, and then my landlord, he's gonna weld through the hole, and hopefully that's gonna be strong enough that we can spin off that broken bolt. He's not looking at it, but welding is happening as we speak. Something is happening. I think it's coming out already. See? Oh no, it snapped. It broke. It broke? Yeah. It broke again. But it started coming out. So round number two. Barbecue. Try number three. Ooh, it's hot. I think it's coming out. It must be. There you go. Round of applause for future professional talk to myself for Clements, yeah. aka my landlord. Good yeah. job, my man. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm not gonna touch it. This could have been a nightmare. Very goodly. Good job, Clements. You earned your lunch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> that worked out pretty neatly, I gotta say much easier than drilling and tapping the new threads. Now I'm gonna use the thread chaser, clean up the threads, and then use brand new bolts. Ongoing smoothly. So it's a good thing we did this because it's full of rust, the threads. Look how easy now it goes in by hand. So I'm gonna do the same with the rest of the threads and then we are ready to put back the subframe. All of the threads cleaned up nicely and now it's time for brand new engine mounts. That needs to go in first. Don't disturb my safety glasses. You know what would be great if this crappy Core gasket starts leaking again. Ah, there we go. Engine mounts are in. So I just need to slowly position the subframe. That one is in. Finally enough, that one as well. Let's get the bolts going. Check it out now. Funk so rubber right about now. Need to connect back the steering shaft to the steering rack. Should slide easier with lube. And now I can also drip into my eye. I think while I'm already here, we might as well replace the filter. Can I do it like this? Fram. Filtrio. Fresh filter going in. Give it a twisty do. Good. Let's write the data on it. 
June 10th, 2075. Now we can get rid of the support bar. Ready, Saint Germain? I gotta go by hand. The stork French can't fit in here. Time for the brand new fan clutch. What? Oh, come on. What's your issue? You don't want to come out? Thank you very much. Fan clutchness is going in. Let's replenish it with oil. This is the magic potion that we're going with. Liquid Molly 10W40, motor protect and oil additive. This is really good stuff. I've been running this in Project Cologne D46 for over 10,000 kilometers now. And the engine is working super smooth. It doesn't use a sip of oil. I've also put it in Project Dubai, got the same experience. So I'm gonna put it in this car as well. Cheers. Let's get this bundle of joy going again. It wants to die because of that stupid air slide valve. Sounds peachy. You know what? It's less tappy than before. That's for sure. And now we're gonna replace the fuel pump. Since I'm not very familiar with the fuel system on this car, I had to do some research. And this is early E30 pre-facelift and it has l jetronic fuel system. And I thought that it has in-tank fuel pump, but it doesn't. It only has fuel sending unit over there. And fuel pump, it's located externally. It's right over there. And that's the thing that was screeching like a dying animal when we first unloaded this car from the tow truck. So it's probably on its last legs and now we're gonna replace it. This is our device that's supplying the engine with fuel and it's sporting a beautiful layer of mold. And I'm thinking this was probably never replaced. Die, mold, die. Come on. Oh, here we go. Take this to the table. I actually wanted to buy all of these brackets brand new because these are rusty and ugly, but they are discontinued, of course, so I'm gonna have to Spritz these a little bit and make them nicer. Yes, come on. Finally broke. Everything is so rusty and crusty. Chill pump is out. This is our brand new pump, original Bosch unit. I cleaned this up with the wire wheel and then sprayed them Satan black. It looks like crap because these parts are really rusty, but replacement parts, don't exist so this is the best I can do at this point new rubber thing can you guess by what it says on these gloves what kind of suspension this car is going to get so this hose here is gonna be a problem this is the original one and you can see that it has this kink here that allows it to be in this tight space and normal fuel hose you can't do that if I do that then I'm gonna make a huge kink and it's gonna restrict fuel that goes through it and I knew this, so I ordered a brand new hose, but here it is. What's wrong with that picture? It has a kink, but it's way too short. And I just double checked, it's the correct part number, but this is what they gave me. So to overcome this, I'm gonna use, well, essentially extend it. So put this on, put this on, clamp here, and then the rest of the normal fuel hose. That's all done, and I'm gonna dig through the parts catalog, see if I can find this hose. This will work, but I don't really like the look of it, so if I find this one, I'm gonna come back and replace this later. <sighs> Monkey orange juice. Let's see if this thing actually runs again. And the fuel sending unit is working again. I actually removed it to look inside the fuel tank off camera, and it all looks good. It's not rusted and the fuel looks good. Took a little bit to build up fuel pressure. 
<laughs> All right, it works. What's next? The clutch, if you remember from the previous episodes, I complained that it takes about that much from the floor for the clutch to grab, like that's it. And that makes it incredibly inconvenient to drive. Plus all of this is dead travel. I know that the brake fluid is bad. It's over 10 years old, so we're gonna change it. And while at it, we're gonna replace clutch slave cylinder and clutch line, then bleed the line and see if the clutch is any better. But if it's still the same, then the transmission needs to come out and we need to replace the clutch kit. That will be the clutch slave cylinder, which we need to remove. The trick here is going to be extensions, lots of them. All right, let go. Hello, look at that. It's too much play. All right, so now we need to disconnect the line. Ooh, that was much easier than expected. Brand new slave cylinder and the clutch line, which we need to attach now. <sighs> That'll do it. Hello, darkness. Look how black that is. I think I'm gonna remove the brake fluid reservoir to clean it. Ooh. Just have a look-see. That's what's inside this reservoir. That's really nasty. Possibly one of the worst brake fluids I've seen so far. That's nice and clean and ready to go back on the car. First the grommets. Fresh brake fluidity. Now you can go underneath and crack open the bleed nipple. And hopefully you can see the fluid is coming out. And it's super black. So yeah, that can definitely be one of the reasons why the clutch pedal was so bad. And hopefully it is. Once you know it, boys and girls, we have a nice firm clutch pedal with no dead travel on the top. Compare this to before, remember dead travel in the pedal? Well, no more. And it actually feels good. Not too hard, not too soft. Let's see how it feels when I drive it. Oh, it's perfect. It's catching a half. About a million times better than before. Ah, oh, that's excellent news. That really is excellent. That means we have a good clutch and now as long as the rear main seal is not leaking, we don't have to take out the transmission. And you know what's interesting about it? This is the original clutch on the car. It was never replaced. It has 250,000 kilometers, it's 38 years old, and it still works. And that tells you a lot about the person who owned this car. Michel drove this car properly and took care of it. He did not burn up that clutch. Anyway, now I want to remove that air slide valve thingy and see if it's possible to persuade it into working. Oh, the most boring air filter box to remove ever. That's the valve that we need to remove. Two coolant hoses on the front and two vacuum lines on the back. Oh, a bit more coolant is coming out. Okay, I plug the line. Oh, you need tiny hands for this. There it is. This is our culprit, the air slide valve. And it's causing idle issues on this car. It's idling way too high when the car is cold and that idle doesn't go down once it starts warming up. And it's actually a quite simple device that serves for the cold start procedure. Coolant goes through here. There's a little thermostat inside and air vacuum goes through here to the intake manifold. So when you start the car cold, this thermostat is closed more air is going into the intake manifold and making the car rev a bit higher. Once it reaches a certain temperature, this thermostat here opens and closes the air passage and the revs go down and then the coolant can go through here. The problem is this is a quite common failure point on these early cars because the thermostat is now stuck and the air is constantly going through it. And the part is obsolete. You cannot buy it brand new anywhere. The only other option is to buy a used one, but I'm pretty sure it's gonna be the exact same thing. Now I'm gonna go boil some water and then dump this section of the valve in it and see if it actually opens or closes. So you can see that the air passageway is open now. Hopefully it doesn't tip over. Oh, I'm gonna melt the plastic. The valve ain't valving. So it started moving, which is good, but it didn't close all the way. So now I'm gonna dump some throttle cleaner in it. It's 
Let's boil some more water. So it's moving up and down a little bit, but it's not closing all the way. Welcome to the kitchen. As you can see, I'm boiling the valve, cooking the valve. And I've used one of these things, which is for lime scale for washing machines. Put the tablet in and I was boiling it with that earlier. And it actually closed all the way. So I don't know if that did anything or this water is just way too hot so that it closed. But we can check it again. Yep, nearly closed all the way. You probably can't see it, but I can. So I'm going to continue cooking it. Maybe use one more of these pills, tablets. It's like boiling an egg, except you're boiling an air slide valve. Watch this. Boop. By the way, don't tell my girlfriend I'm doing this. She's not home, so I'm having my merry way in the kitchen. Later, I'm going to drink this. Nope. See you tomorrow. While on internet last night, I ended up on a Russian forum and I found a post that's 10 years old and someone bought this thing brand new then and tested it. The way it works is around 20 degrees Celsius, it slowly starts to open the thermostat. Around 70, 75, it's nearly closed, but not all the way. There's a few millimeter gap between being fully closed and around 95, 100 degrees Celsius, it's closed all the way with one millimeter gap at the end. And that's pretty much what I got with this one yesterday. When I was boiling it, it was closed all the way with one millimeter gap and boiling water is around 100 degrees Celsius. And when I put it in a cup and put hot water, it's nearly closed, so not all the way, which is kind of consistent with those results. Will this work? Probably not. This is 38 years old. There's wax and stuff and thermostat inside. It's probably not that great. But I'm gonna put it back and see what happens because there's nothing else I can do at this point. If this fails, then I'm gonna have to do something else. Perhaps get some electronic clap or whatever that's gonna open and close this manually. I don't know. Let's put it back and see what happens. That's reconnected. So what I wanna do now is check for vacuum leaks. We got smoke. We gotta open throttle flap as well. Okay, so we have no vacuum leaks. Thousand five hundred RPM, which is pretty much what it should do when that stupid thing is working. It's gonna idle high until it warms up. Yep, idling like a lunatic. Temperature is nearly at the middle. Yeah, now it's at one thousand five hundred RPM and it's surging up and down. What is the matter with you? Something else is going on here. It's not the idle valve. Sit rep, I made some progress, at least I think. I got it to idle normally. I went back and played with ignition timing. If you remember, it was slightly off when I did the timing belt, so I put it in the straight position, the rotor arm with the distributor body. Now I went back and unbolted the bolt that holds the clamp and the distributor body, and that way you can move it left and right and alter the idle of the car. It's gonna idle higher or lower. So I messed around with that for a little bit and I got it to idle perfect. Listen to this. It's idling about 700, 800 RPM, really smoothly as well. So that's it, it doesn't idle like a lunatic anymore. The issue that I have now is the same issue that I had even before I started doing all this work on the car. And that is when you give it throttle, the revs hang. Right now it's revving at 1,100, 200 RPM. And it doesn't want to come down for at least a couple of minutes. So it's really strange. It's idling high. Then turn it off, turn it back on. And we're back to perfect idle. What the issue is, I have no idea anymore. Even when I clamp off the air slide valve, everything is working perfect. So I don't think we have an issue with that anymore. I don't know. Now I'm going to continue troubleshooting, see if I can figure it out. You got to admit something. I find it easier to work and troubleshoot issues on the M70 V12 in the E32 and E31 than this. 
there's just million cables, vacuum lines and stuff, and this controls that, and that controls that. It's just a huge mess. Anyway, while I'm still spinning my brain, let's replace the transmission and differential fluid. I have some pretty remarkable news. I had the car running all this time. I even drew it in the yard for a little bit. The clutch feels great, but have a look at there. We do not have a leaking rear main seal. I can't, I just, I don't believe that. Amazing. So that leak that was here was actually coming from the old pen gasket. We changed it, no more leaks there. Great news, means that I have to take out the transmission. Anyway, let's change the fluid. As always, first remove the fill plug. There we are. It's actually fairly clean. Put it back in. Going with ATF, I'm running this stuff in all of my cars now. E60, 30, 46, and it's working wonderfully. It cured the cold start difficulty shifting on my E39 M5. Let it drip out and then close the plug. Close the plug. And now the diff. That looks pretty clean as well. This is an open diff, so we're using 75W90. Whoa, 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 whoa. <sighs> Done. And now we're gonna proceed with my least favorite activity, replace the brake lines and bleed the brakes. The rear ones actually don't look too bad, but they are over 10 years old for sure. And they cost like three euros, so might as well replace them. I don't wanna cut my fingers on a heat shield. Mm. Welcome to the rear drum brakes. Oh, look how black that is. This is the most disgusting brake fluid I've seen in a while. Yep, we have good brakes. You're never gonna guess who's the new supporter of the channel. Hmm. Wrong, it's Bilstein. Oh yes, they're providing struts and shocks for the E30 also Project Rally, the E60 M5. Those are coming a bit later because they don't have them in stock right now, but November, December is when we're gonna do the suspension on that car. For the E30, they're here right now. These are Bilstein B6 shocks, and Project Dubai, the E38 750IL has the same, and I adore the ride on that car. It is extremely well balanced, super comfortable and super sporty at the same time, which is like, number one important thing to me. And I love driving it, and I hope Alex in the UK is enjoying it as well. It passed UK MOT recently, by the way, with flying colors. Anyway, the E30, it's pretty slow with, what, 125 horsepower. It does not have power sting, so it's all about the handling with that one. And that's where these come in. They're going to completely transform the way that car handles. For the springs, I use real OEM to search for part numbers, and they are between 15 to 20 different part numbers for springs for the E30. It just doesn't make any sense. And I was hoping to find m Technique slash Bilstein springs, but they're of course not available anymore. Most of them are not. So I had to settle for these. These are standard springs for 320i and 325i as well. The E30 right now, the ride height, it's pretty high. I don't think it's normal and probably something to do with the fact that it's the very early one. So I hope that these are going to lower it at least a little bit. We're gonna measure before and after. These are Les Fuzzes, which is a Swedish word for a butterfly. No, but I have these on Project Cologne E46 for a while now, and they're doing pretty well, so I'm happy with the choice there. At the same time, we're going to overhaul complete suspension, at least the front part of it. And these are brand new control arms from Lemforder. The ones on the car right now are super rusty, and even if the ball joints are really good, I don't feel like painting them. New strut mounts, control arm bushings, tie rods, and more parts scattered around to make this car feel like brand new. So let's get going. We're gonna start with the rear shocks. 
Now we're going to go inside the car and unbolt the top mount. I love that sound. Ooh, it smells like mold in here. Mold and mildew is having the party in the trunk, so I need to use the mask. How do we remove this now? Peel the onion. <laughs> Zippity zip. And it's out. About the easiest rear shock to replace in the world. But we also need to replace the spring. Well, there we are. All yeah, right. It's out. Let's compare the springs. The new one is a little bit shorter and hopefully that lowers the car a tiny bit. Got this stuff brand new as well. Clean up the seating position. Good, it's in. It should go up like that. There's load on the suspension. First, take apart the old one to see how to assemble the new one. That's all of the hardware, brand new. Pretty big difference, wouldn't you agree? That one is very, very tired. Rubber dampener. And then this needs to go in here. Plate and the bolt. Now go for good and tight. Yep, that's not going anywhere because that's a self-locking nut. My Milwaukee impact gun is holding the shock for me. While I start nuts. Brand new ones, of course. Now we need to deploy Hugh Jackman Jr. Here he is. Perfect. This one we are just going to lightly tighten and then the final torque is done with the car on the ground. That's what the repair manual says. Thank you, Jackman. You fulfilled your duty. Now I just gotta copy paste everything on the other side. Now we're gonna drive back and forth and then I can torque the lower shock bolt. Is it lower in the back? It is not. Jeez Louise, it's like an SUV. And that's the rear shocks done. By the way, what do you think of this exhaust? I have two issues with it. One is that he only has one tailpipe. This is a six cylinder, you should have two. So it looks ugly. And the biggest annoyance is that it's simply way too quiet. You cannot hear this engine at all. It sounds like crap. So I would like to replace it with something that has two tailpipes and it's a bit louder so I can hear this engine. Just not sure with which brand to go with. I did find one exhaust from a company called Simmons, I wanna say. It's complete, rear section, the middle box and all the way, all of the pipes all the way to the headers. And the price is pretty fair, around 500 euros. The only thing with it, it's not stainless steel, it's some sort of luminized steel. So I'm not sure about the quality and how long it's going to last. But the sound is pretty decent, the price is fair, so I might get it. Another one that I'm considering is Super Sprint and Eisenman, of course. They have top-notch quality stuff, but with them the problem is they only have the back box. Don't think they have the complete system which I need because it only has one pipe coming from the mid silencer. Not sure, let me know. I'll think about it and then probably replace it. All right, I don't even need to measure. It's the same right height in the back, maybe even higher. And it looks like an SUV. I can go off-roading with this car. So I'm thinking Eibach lowering springs are definitely going on this car. The problem is if I put them now, the car will not pass old timer tooth inspection because the car needs to be original condition. It cannot have lowering springs to pass that inspection. So once it passes that inspection, we're gonna revisit the springs and do something about the right height. And now the front suspension. The brakes for this car are so cheap that we are just gonna replace this rusty stuff as well. Off with the caliper. What a weird looking pads.
Whoops, wheel bearing feels great. Unbolt the sway bar. Right, now we can pop some ball joints. I'll try a couple of hits here, see if it's gonna come out. If not, I'll get my ball joint popper. Oh, the boot is torn. And I didn't do that. I didn't touch the boot. Not the smoothest one. Probably dirt and stuff is inside. And now we can unbolt the strut from the top. And that'll be the complete thing with the wheel hub out. Now I need to compress the rusty spring. That should do it. I love, love this spring compressor. It is the best. 90 euros I ever spent. The top mount, there's a spring. And now it's the fun bit, struggling with this giant nut. Since we are not using this collar, Bilstein shocks come with a new one. I'm gonna make a little groove here and then slowly start hitting it with the hammer and loosen it that way. Oh, movement. Excellent. This is Monroe, so it was replaced. Monroe. Normally I would take this apart all the way and drop it off for powder coating, but it's Saturday and waiting time it's five days to get the parts powder coated, so I don't have time. If I do that, the video is gonna be late for about a week. So I'm just gonna clean it up as best as I can and then proceed with the reassembly. In case you're wondering why is the video taking so long to make, this is why, because I waste my time on stuff like this. Cleaned it up, used the wire wheel, scotch bright, and then painted it with some high temperature resistant paint. And it looks nice, presentable. Not great, but presentable. It was really rusty and ugly before, so now I can put it back on the car. And it'll look the part with brand new suspension on the car. That actually looks really good. Now I need to clean and make sure that the inside of the tube is free of oil. If we were using standard strut inserts, hydraulic ones, then we would use around 30 milliliters of oil inside the tube before we put the insert in. That way it's going to help with the heat transfer and whatnot. But Bilstein shocks, they are gas filled, so they don't require any oil. And instructions say remove the oil and don't use any. So that's what we're going to do. Time for the new strut to go in. This needs to go in first because this is what's going to keep the dust boot. So the instructions also say to compress it one time. This is the new collar or the locking nut. All right, the good thing is also you can hit it more once this is on the car, it's bolted in place and then that way I have more leverage to hit it here. So we'll do that again. Clean this, brand new spring pad. There's no bump stop for Bilstein shocks. They have internal bump stop. So all you need to use is the dust boot. 
brand new spring plate and spring pad. Now we need to compress the spring. Perfect. Oh yeah, that is good. There we go. That's one strut down. Now we're gonna focus on replacing the tie rod and the control arm. Yeah, this inner tie rod, it's way too loose and it's full of rust. So definitely a smart thing to replace. Oh, that wasn't too bad. And now the fun part, I'm bolting this ball joint. So this nut, it's pretty rusty, so I soaked it in some penetrating fluid. And now let's see if I can get it off. Oh, I don't believe it, it's spinning off. Look at that, I have a shorter handle. <laughs> Oh, the ball jam popped. The problem is now it's gonna spin and I cannot undo the top nut because it's so freaking rusted. Right, yes. Good, great. So I think we're gonna cut it off here. Actually, no, I can't do that. And this bottom part, it's a bit wider than the hole itself, so I'm not sure if it's gonna come out up top or not. Right, that's off. Now the million dollar question, will this come off on top? Control arm is out. Yeah, that's what I was afraid of. Well, what now, genius? So now I'm gonna try and cut the groove in the nut. Finally! And this is why I hate working on rusty cars. One bolt turns into several hours of labor. Should have been done by now, but no. The nut had to be rusty. So that's the results of destruction. Cut the nut in half and broke it off. And now I need to remove the bracket and the bushing from this old control arm. Say hello to my cheap hydraulic press. That's out. These are standard E30 control arm bushings across the line. And here's the new one from Lemforder. But a friend recommended that instead I use these. These are off E36 M3 Eurospec 3.2. Reason being standard E30 control arm bushings have a lot of flex in them because they're not solid. You can see holes. While the E36 one is solid and has a lot less flex in them. He had them on his E30 for a while and the steering response is just better. It's more precise, more tighter. So I think we're gonna go with these and see what they feel like. Need to push out the old bushing. You know, this press was only 120 euros, but it's paying off really nicely now. That was good. Where did everything go? And the bastard is still not out. Is it out? It sure isn't. Now it's out. Now we're gonna line up this notch with that one and slowly start pressing it in. Perfect. Beautifully pressed in. I went ahead and professionally repainted it as well. Need to press in the control arm bushing. Bit of silicon spray. So that goes like that. Can't even start with my hand. Oh, I pushed it on with my hand. So don't need to use the press. And silicon spray, we're gonna use water or brake cleaner or whatever once this is on the car. And that way I can wash all of this out and the rubber is going to grab firmer the control arm. Since we have enough space now, let's replace the sway bar bushing. 
Here we go. Let's see if I got the wrong one. Would you look at that? I got the right one. Yeah. Control arm going back in, and I also transferred the sway bar bracket, painted it as well, so it looks spiffy. Ah. Now torque it until something starts breaking in your arm. Yeah. That should do it. Now the tie rod. Here is the new one. So now I need to make sure that the length is exactly the same. Well, not exactly, but close to it so that the car can drive in a straight line to the alignment shop. Look at that. That's how that should act. Perfect. Put a bit more grease here just because I have it. That's full stop. Push this here. Time for the strut to make reappearance. Bolts, nuts. So as this has a bushing in it, we're not gonna torque it now, but we are gonna torque it with the car on the ground. If I do it now, then it's just gonna twist when I lower the car. Ball joint, we can tie it all the way. That's tight, not going anywhere. That's the dust boot set. Suspension on the right side, done. And you know what's the best part of it? I'm gonna be back in here replacing these off-roading springs in a couple of weeks. I found used M-Technique springs for a pre-facelift T30. The problem is the guy is on vacation. He's coming back in three weeks, so then he can ship them to me. I'll drop them off a powder coating and throw them onto the car. They should definitely lower the car. Some say 10, some say 20 millimeter. I have no idea, but it's gonna be better than this. And it can also pass tooth inspection because the springs are original for the car. They're not aftermarket lowering springs. Anyway, let's do the brakes now. Brilliant. Brand new shiny disc. You know how much this brake disc costs? 23 euros. And it's OEM, Techstar. Caliper bracket goes back. I know what you're thinking. I wish I had the time to refurbish the calipers as well, but I don't, because if I do that, it's gonna take me another week before the video comes out and September, it's not a very good month for delays and there's a lot more projects waiting. Maybe I do it once I get my wood blasting cabinet. It's gonna be much easier than to wire brush all of this manually. For now, they're working and at the end of the day, that's the most important thing. Good, that's done. I gotta say, this was a ton of work and I've only done the half of it. Thankfully, I can just snap my fingers and copy paste everything to the other side. Yeah, I'm pretty sweaty, hungry, dirty, gonna go home and then tomorrow gonna pick this up again. On this side, because the exhaust is not in the way, we can access the nut for the ball joint from the top. So we're gonna try and do it that way. Probably the ball is spinning now, which is perfect. There we are. <sighs> we are done, but we need to clean up the mess. Now we're gonna drive back and forth and then torque the sway bar bushings. That'll do it. And this is the old pile of parts that I'm going to recycle. 
gonna save the springs and the strut mounts, those are good, everything else is trash. And that concludes the suspension refresh. Unfortunately, the car is not registered, so we cannot take it for a ride, but let's at least take it for a quick spin in the yard and get a preview of how the suspension is going to feel. Here we go. You know, I can't get it past the second gear here, but I can already tell the difference in suspension. It was very floaty before. Now it's just really firm and nice over the bumps. Well, at least that I can feel here in the yard. I cannot wait to feel it on the actual road. You know, it used to have a little clunk before in the front. Guess what? Now it doesn't. And the clutch is really good, shifts perfect. The whole car feels great. The engine is working really smoothly. Steering is really precise. Well, how did you come out? Did I run you over? Oh, that's heavy. Do I need two hands? Yes, the ride height is horrendous. It looks like it's ready to climb a mountain. But bear with me, M Technique springs are coming and as soon as they come in, I'm gonna put them on the car and hopefully that lowers it somewhat. But also bear in mind, this is early E30 with standard suspension, tiny 14 inch rims. It just looks ridiculous by today's standards. I mean, I can put my head into that gap. Hopefully it will improve though. That's pretty much all of the mechanical work done on the car. Certainly everything it needs to pass German technical inspection and also a lot of preventive maintenance, so it's good for years to come. The last piece of the puzzle is to figure out a weird idle issue. I've been getting some useful tips from Pierre, the guy from Belgium who gave me E21 parts and also another nice subscriber named Mick and none other than Jason Camisa, who is not only a phenomenal automotive journalist, but also knows his way around mechanics. Jason, I don't care what other people say, you do not look like Adam Sandler. <coughs> yeah, you do. Anyway, we pretty much narrowed it down to me having an issue with sticky distributor and or ignition timing. I'm gonna take that apart, see what it looks like, possibly even replace it, and then use a timing gun to set the ignition timing. Never done that before, but we'll see how I fare. And if that fails, well, maybe we plop a V12 in it. At least I know how to fix that. All of that is coming in the next episode. We're also going to clean up the interior fix the damage door, paint correction, and it's pretty much ready for its clash with German tooth inspection. As always, thank you very much for watching. If you're in the mood, perhaps grab a t-shirt. The link is in the description and maybe even subscribe if you haven't. That would be nice. I love you all and I'll see you soon.